Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Affordable Housing Network and Black Wealth Data Center webinar, 55 Years of the Fair Housing Act, the State of Housing Disparities in the U.S., and What More Can Be Done. I'm Dara Duratinsky. I'm the Director of Network Building at Prosperity Now. And I wanted to provide some information on housekeeping for you all before we get started. First, this webinar is being recorded and will be mailed to registrants and available online within one week. All webinar attendees are muted to ensure sound quality, but we do want to hear from you. So you can ask a question or share your thoughts at any time by typing into the text box of your GoToWebinar control panel. And if you experience any technical issues, please email GoToWebinar at prosperitynow.org. And we do want to make sure that you get the most out of today's call. So we recommend joining from a quiet space, grabbing a coffee or snack and settling in. Engage with us, send us your questions and comments as you listen, and reflect on ways to apply what you learned today to your own work. At Prosperity Now, our mission is to ensure everyone in our country has a clear path to financial stability, wealth, and prosperity. And we certainly view housing and home ownership as a clear way to wealth and prosperity. Today, we'll do our welcome and housekeeping, which we're doing now. Then we'll hear from some of our partners, the Blackwell Data Center's homeownership and housing data. We'll discuss some fair housing policies and programs. We'll save some time from questions from you to our speakers, and we'll close with some next steps. And with that, our speakers today are Lalt Jill Cunningham from Gesher Human Services, who will be our moderator for our discussion, Harsha from Blackwell Data Center, and Morgan Williams, National Fair Housing Alliance. And I'll kick it over to you, Lalcha. All righty. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you all so much for joining. And Dara, thank you so much for uh, the introduction. Um, again, I'm Lacha Cunningham. I oversee a housing and financial counseling agency um, here in Michigan. I'm right out, we're in Southfield, Michigan, right outside of Detroit. Um, and I just want to start with um, one of our most sought out programs at our agency is housing. So um, for me, it's very important that we, we stay in touch on what is happening with fair housing and also affordable housing um, as well. And so I just want to talk briefly about some of the things that I think that have worked um, for me um, and my agency and really helping to um, address some of the issues that are uh, within the uh, fair housing um, space at this point. So um, I want to encourage all of you, and I know there's a lot of practitioners that are on um, again, so thank you for joining as well. But um, I want to talk uh, just a, a few minutes about a couple of things that, again, that I, I found to be very important um, within our agency um, as it relates to a fair housing. So the first point I wanted to bring about is the participation. I think it's so important that we all participate in some of the activities that um, are, are being held in your local uh, fair housing um, alliance within your uh, state. Um, again, it keeps you updated on things that are happening. Um, it, does, it discusses some of the trends. Also, it gives you the information on complaints, um, how they're being addressed, um, and also um, just what to do. You know, um, I think um, it's important that we stay on top of you know some of the most recent uh, violations that are happening uh, within fair housing. Um, so again, it's very important that we uh, participate in, in those fair housing uh, activities. Get to know uh, your your local uh, fair housing um, you know employees and that staff there. Work closely with you um, with them so they can give you um, the information that you need to really help your staff and your communities um, as well. You know, and for those folks um, who are in Michigan, um, you know, we have a, a fair housing breakfast coming up here in October of this year um, in Ann Arbor. So make sure that you take time to attend those activities. Again, it's so important that we really stay on top of things that are happening um, within uh, the fair housing um, space. Um, next thing I wanna you to encourage you to do is keeping your staff well trained. Um, it's very important, helping them understand what those violations are, helping them to be able to spot the red flags. Because a lot of times I find that families um, aren't aware that they've been violated. But again, 
having your counselors know the information again about the violations uh, some of the red flags and this the trends and even helping them understand you know what's going to be a valid complaint and what isn't um is very very uh key and um also lastly making sure that you incorporate um fair housing training within your sessions um, that you're having, you know, at some of your agencies, um, making sure that your um, participants and even um, members of the community are aware of those activities and invite them out to join, you know, workshops and webinars and things of that nature. It's so important that we we advise the community uh, um, about the programs that are available. Again, uh, many families, um, they need this information and they don't have it. And it, it's really up to us to make sure that they're aware um, of what's going on uh, as it relates to fair housing and then really understand what those violations are you know in my agency we we talk to um, our clients um, about you know obviously the violations but again many of them don't even know that they're being violated they're just having you know regular conversations with us and then you know as a a, a member you know of fair housing and understanding what they are we are better um, equipped to guide them and so those are just a couple of key points that i wanted to really mention before we really get into the heart of what we'll be discussing um here today um, and so the, I'm going to wrap up with that piece and then we're going to move on to Hersha um, and he's going to talk about um, information at the uh, Black Wave Wealth Data, Data Center. Thank you for joining us, Harsha. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, let's see. Uh, can any, I'm just trying to figure out uh, my screen sharing options please bear with me here okay so can everyone see the blackwell data center uh, as their screen we see it yep yes. okay sounds great thank you uh, it, Good afternoon, everyone. I am Hacha Malayusila. I am the director of data at the Blackwell Data Center. We are an initiative that's funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies, and we are currently incubated at Prosperity Now. Uh, the mission of Blackwell Data Center is to democratize data around black wealth. We do that through our racial wealth equity database, which currently has 37 public and private data sets on wealth in the United States, and 18 of them are like publicly available for all of our visitors to interact with. Uh, when you go to our platform, blackwelldata.org, uh, you have information here about the racial wealth equity database, and you can start interacting with them by clicking explore data. So the Blackwell Data Center has an expanded definition of wealth. We arrange information in six topic areas, assets and debt, business ownership, education, employment, home ownership, and population demographics. For the sake of uh, this webinar, we'll spend a lot of time looking at the data that we have in our home ownership page. And then we will also look into like a couple of maps on our assets and debt page. So to go to our home ownership page, I'm going to click on the home ownership tab here. And when you come to each of our Explore data pages, you will see that information is organized starting at a national level all the way down to a local level. We also have a data methodology section in each of our pages uh, to tell you a little bit more about the data sets that we've used. And uh, being completely transparent around the data transformations that the center had to make so that the information is accessible to all of you. So the first chart that you see here is uh, data that is coming from the Housing and Mortgage uh, Disclosure Act data sets, which is being maintained by uh, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. Uh, you will see information that starts into 2018 and goes all the way till 2021. Uh, you will see that information is broken down by race. And right now we are looking at uh, the interest rate uh, that is charged for like applicants. And we are looking at applicants that have filed jointly and you'll see that in 2021 
on average, like black households had like one of the highest interest rates uh, uh, at 3.139%. Asian households had lowest interest rates at 2.851%. From 2018 to 2021, as the interest rates dropped throughout the pandemic, black households still faced the highest average interest rates. In 2018, it was around 5.63%. Now, interest rate is like one of the measures. Now, you can also look at what's happening with property values broken down by race. You will see that like with black households from 2018 to 2021, uh, the property value has increased. Uh, in 2018, the average property value was around three hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars. In 2021, it's around four hundred and thirteen thousand dollars. And even while the property rates have increased for black households, uh, in 2021, the average property value for black black households is still the lowest uh, when compared to other races within the data set. Uh, we provide like additional filtering options. Right now, we've looked at applicant sex as female. You can look as joint, but you can also look at how the data changes when you select for either female or male. You'll see like change in property values. Right now, if you're just looking at uh, applicants uh, where the applicant sex is female. Uh, so this is the first chart uh, at a national level. Uh, you can download each of our charts as an image a pdf or a powerpoint and you can also share them in social media we have information around both the data set uh, and the year in each of our data visualizations for the second chart i'm just going to like quickly spend some time here here it's basically telling you for 100 people like how uh, like how many of them have applied for a conventional loan so you will see that black households have like some of the lowest application uh, rates for conventional loan type uh, and let's see what happens when we look at fha loans you will see that black households have uh, the highest rate for uh, the federal housing administration loans why does this matter uh, like for conventional loans uh, you typically have to put down 20 percent as down payment and for fha loans the down payment uh, amount is usually around five percent of the property value um, conventional loans have like better interest rates than fha loans so uh, when policymakers are thinking about how to make housing more accessible well, for black communities, these are like some of the data points that can help uh, like make financial uh, institutions uh, include equity in the process. So these are like some of the charts uh, at a national level. At a state level, uh, like we can quickly look through this map. So right now, like we are looking for information for black households. Uh, the default is for like applications denied and you will see that like many states in the south actually fall within the top 25 percent of geographies where applications have been denied uh, for home ownership and black households you can also see like what happens when you change it to purchased loans and you will see that like some of the states with the highest uh uh numbers of purchased loans for black households are in texas uh and Louisiana. Uh, so you can like look for a state that you operate in to see like what, how, how does this information break down for both applications denied, loan originated and purchased loans. Then we have uh, like local level uh, maps. So I'm gonna spend like some time here uh, talking about the relationship between climate change and home ownership. Uh, we define local level either at a county level or a zip code level uh, for this chart uh, information is shown for all counties in the united states what you're looking down is a breakdown of social vulnerability index it's a score that is calculated by the cdc and it tells you how prepared your county is to face or weather infrastructure and climate related shocks uh, the lower the score is, uh, the better it is, or uh, like your county is more prepared. So now when you look at what's happening in like majority black cities, uh, you can 
play with the black population percentage slider. So I'm going to move it to around 50% here. So it will like filter the entire map to show you only counties that have at least 50% of black population. All of these counties are in the southeast of United States, and all of them are at a really high risk for uh, climate change. Uh, and what does that mean when, as a homeowner, like you are in one of these counties? Uh, like, how is your county thinking about being prepared to meet uh, uh, infrastructure that meets uh, the climate change? climate change risks uh, that is posed. So the social vulnerability index map uh, is like a great tool for like counties and cities to plan ahead and invest in like climate resilient infrastructure. Let's look at what's happening in Hines County, Mississippi. Uh, a, a bit of a background information, Hines County, Jackson, Mississippi is in Hines County. If I click at Hines County here on the map, you'll see like uh, three data points populated below. The first one shows what the social vulnerability index is. It's 0.9, which is very high. The second shows uh, what percentage is black population in this county, like 73% of the population is black. And finally, 62.2% uh, of the housing units are occupied by black homeowners. So uh, as Jackson, Mississippi in the last few months went through water infrastructure crises, uh, this information was actually available uh, for the counties to uh, start planning ahead and be proactive in terms of climate and infrastructure risks. So this is just one example of how Hines County could have used the social vulnerability index to pre prepare ahead. So uh, this is an example of a local level map and how you would interact with uh, maps within the Blackwell Data Center. I will quickly go to the assets and debt page and then jump to local. Here we have information around home ownership rate, both at a county and zip code level. So we've seen, we've interacted with a county level map. So I will now, I will now move that down to zip code level. It'll take a couple of minutes, but it should populate information for all the zip codes in the United States around what the home ownership rate is. This data is coming from the American Community Survey. Uh, let's pick a city, for example. Uh, let's look at Cleveland, Ohio, as an example. Once I search for Cleveland, Ohio, it populates zip codes for all uh, zip codes within Cleveland, Ohio, and it's a heat map. So the dark brown color actually indicates how uh, zip codes that have like the lowest home ownership rates. So let me just pick one zip code, for example. It's zip code 44103. You will see that uh, the black population percentage is around 74.8%, and then the home ownership rate for this zip code is around 33.2%. Uh, let me see if I can pick another zip code. Right now, this zip code is 44040. The dark green color indicates it's within the top 25% of geographies. And like here, you will see that this zip code, which has high home ownership rate around 94.2% only has around 3% as the black population percentage. So as policymakers, as community organizers, uh, if you are interested in increasing home ownership rate within your community, within your city, I'm hoping that the zip code level uh, maps not only shows like variation in like black population percentage and home ownership rate, but it also a mix a, like a targeting or identifying underserved communities uh, like more accessible for the work that you do in your communities. Finally, I'll quickly do an introduction to our newest tool. This tool is called the Black Wealth Indicators tool, where you can actually do a county by county comparison around like key Black Wealth Indicators. So I'm gonna quickly pick one county, this is Butler County in Alabama, and I'm gonna say generate graphs. 
So if you do not pick a second county, the default comparisons are to a national level. And let's look at like some of the key black wealth indicators here for this county. Uh, I'll call out a few. Let's look at broadband internet access. Uh, for Butler County, it's around 72%. The national average is at 85%. Uh, bachelor's degree attainment for Butler County, 10%. National, it's 23%. Uh, what is the home ownership rate for Butler County? It's 58%. It's like higher than the national average of 43%. So this tool actually allows you to see a lot among these black wealth indicators where your county is faring better, where it is not, and like use this to benchmark your county against the national standard or against uh, a neighboring county. So I'm hoping the information that I've shown here is useful and like happy to take uh, questions uh, in the Q&A section. Uh, with that, I, I'm going to like stop sh uh, sharing my screen. And I'll pass it back to Lalsha. All righty, Hertha, thank you so much um, for that information. A lot of great data. Um, there was definitely things that I wasn't aware of, and I'm sure maybe it's the same um, for some of you out there. Um, so again, if you have questions about any of the information that Harsha uh, presented to us, please uh, feel free to um, enter your uh, questions or comments in the chat. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to bring on Morgan Williams, who is the General Counsel for the Fair Housing um, Alliance. Um, please uh, welcome welcome him. Uh, we are going to have a discussion about how uh, we can help, um, you know, tackle the, the many issues um, that a lot of our communities are facing around, um, you know, fair housing and how we can really start to uh, bridge this gap. So uh, Morgan, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, taking that time out. Thanks. It's great to, to be here with you and with everyone and I appreciate the discussion and look forward to the questions. Awesome. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and, and dive into some questions here. Um, again, um, if you have questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat while we are um, discussing this. Sorry, it looks like I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Are, we, are you hearing an echo? No? All righty. All right. So one of the first questions um, I wanted to ask Morgan is, what does a fair housing look like today? I know that for many years, it's probably looked a little bit different and there's been laws that there's come into play, um, but can you tell us a little bit about what fair housing looks like today? Yeah, Morgan, can you hear me? Thanks, thanks so much, Latasha. Latasha. Um, uh, it's a good question. And, you know, as I understand it, I think, you know, part of what you're asking about in the context of this discussion is a sort of state of housing disparities yes. in particular. And, um, you know, there's been greater, uh, I think, attention to the racial wealth gap in the country in recent years. And, you know, there was the uh, protests, the Black Lives Matter protests in the wake of the murders of, of, of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd in the summer of 2020. And there was rhetoric around a racial re reckoning. And, um, you know, I think, you know, it's fair to say that there are elements of the housing industry um, that have been subject to greater scrutiny since by elements of the federal government, by the industry itself, and by advocates. And there, you know, there are kind of, I think, shifts in fair housing and developments in the wake of kind of a greater attention to the racial wealth gap. And so, you know, I was going to um, perhaps to just uh, kick things off, give a brief uh, presentation over to sort of the state of U.S. housing disparities, which I think are, I think, of uh, greater um, understanding in recent years, and then jump into a discussion with you, discussion about the solutions that have been really um, more significantly pioneered in recent years. So with that. Um, I don't know if uh, the mechanics of the slide here, um, if I can advance them or if I just sort of suggest maybe next slide, but we can go to the next slide here. And, um, you know, I think just to talk briefly about history in terms of the centuries of government and private sector policies um, that have resulted in structural inequities, um, those today. Uh, next slide, please.
Sorry about that. Um, in particular, uh, just again on the historical point here, the New Deal policies of the Homeowners Loan Corporation and other federal agencies in the 1930s and since um, perpetuated redlining and the dual credit market, and many of these patterns still exist today. Next slide, please. I think in terms of our own assessment of housing and its significance, especially when you look then at issues of housing segregation and the impacts of housing segregation on communities of color, is how housing and where you live impacts so many aspects of your access to resources and in recent policy discussion, access to opportunity. And that has been measured in different ways in recent years and is sort of represented here in this image on this slide. Um, next slide, please. Um, but it's also, you know, I think comes across in stark terms when you look at things like just um, health and community health and segregation and the fact that segregation across neighborhoods impacts all elements of a person's life down to stark differences in life expectancy. And um, this is a map of a part of New Orleans where on the, um, on the yellow side, you have a Lakeview neighborhood, uh, it's predominantly white. And on the red side, you have Gentilly neighborhood, which is predominantly African-American historically. And, um, you know, this is, uh, this is sort of the stark differences in life expectancy just to cross that line. Um, next slide, please. And, you know, we saw this, of course, in COVID in terms of mortality, a virus that affects anyone that it comes in contact with. But, of course, based on segregation and other community factors, you know, we saw really radical disparities in the impacts of mort uh, the mor uh, of uh, mortality rates associated with COVID. Next slide, please. And you know, a part of this is is borne out in the housing market significantly, and that's I think you know what we're here to focus on today. And you know, this is a part of what you know you can drill down on with you know uh, the the harshes. Um, presentation and the information that you can access in the Black Wealth Data Center website. So um, that's a great resource and, you know, one that I think we need to link up with local fair housing centers across the country as well. And we'll, we'll, we need to do more to do that. Um, but, you know, what you see is a stark homeownership um, gap <laughs> between white, <clears throat> excuse me, white households and households of color. Um, and that this is persistent. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here that's it, um, you know, in, in graphic form. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, those, those figures you can access with great granular detail um, at the Black Wealth Data Center. And so definitely encourage folks to do so. Um, next slide, please. Um, but to talk a little bit about the context in which the housing market operates and drives these outcomes, um, you know, we have, um, you know, analyzed um, that there really is a dual credit market. Um, there's a mainstream financial credit market, um, which is in some ways significantly redlined, both in terms of its geographic services, um, but also in terms of uh, various uh, credit limits and other loan origination requirements that are overlay on the process. And, um, and then there's a second, you know, fringe financial services market. And um, those, that dual credit market really overlays onto our, our communities uh, as they are reflected in real segregated ways that have persisted since the days of the redlining maps. Um, next slide, please. And uh, so if you look at the communities who are using alternative financial credit services, you see that it's, you know, predominantly African-American um, by percentage here. And um, that's really when you're using those alternative financial credit services, not only um, um, doesn't allow you to build credit, but it harms your credit score in different systemic ways. Um, next slide, please. Um, further sort of locking communities out of the 
of the housing market. Um, and a kind of sort of another component to this is what was, was referred to as the appraisal gap or um, instances in which an appraisal comes back for lower than the proposed home sale. And uh, recent research by Fannie Mae um, has shown that appraisals are more likely, appraisers are more likely to find that the appraiser, appraised value fell below the contract price in black and Latino census tracts by a striking discrepancy. Um, and there's other research out there around sort of systemic bias in the appraisal industry. Next slide. And as a function of this bias, um, there's really, you know, deep um, wealth uh, that is lost um, by Black and Latino communities. And, you know, in this assessment um, by Dr. Andre Perry, after controlling for socioeconomic characteristics like crime rates, educational rankings, and structural features, homes in Black neighborhoods are undervalued. Um, by about $48,000 per home, and that equates to about $156 billion in lost equity. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, this translates into the, the racial wealth gap that we see today, in which white households have roughly 10 times the wealth of black households and eight times the wealth of Latino households. Next slide, <clears throat> please. And this is the final slide. <laughs> And uh, and it, this is just depicting that that racial wealth gap is uh, gap is growing over time, and uh, and so you know it's it's been persistent, and um, it's something that we're working to address through housing policy issues. And there's sort of recent developments in the housing market that bode sort of well for sort of strategically and affirmatively addressing issues that are driving this racial wealth gap. Awesome, awesome, Morgan. Thank you uh, so much uh, for that information in the slides. A lot of great um, information. And um, as Dara said, um, you know, um, some of the PowerPoints, this, this presentation will be available um, after this meeting so that, you know, a few of you may be able to go back um, if you need to. Um, but just diving a little bit deeper um, into this conversation. Um, Morgan, if you could just, I know that we talked about a lot of things that are happening, but can we talk a little bit about some additional ways that we can try to address fair housing? We we understand that, you know, we've been working on it and there's been a lot of conversation around it. And, you know, obviously this is a huge topic um, for a lot of families now, um, you know, as you stated earlier, especially since some of the things that have happened, you know, uh, with George Floyd and, you know, Breonna Taylor and and, and other, um, unfortunately, other folks that have lost their lives. But what what is it that you feel that we can do more of to to help address this issue thanks yeah i mean one of the tools that um has been advanced you know um within the industry and that we've pushed for over the past couple of years has been what's referred to as special purpose credit programs and special purpose credit programs are targeting tar excuse me targeted lending products that are designed to specifically advantage an economically disadvantaged group of people. And these are lending products that actually can be created to benefit, you know, a specific class of people along racial lines or gender lines in order to advantage that class of people who are store historically were disadvantaged. And um, it's not something that's new in a manner because it's been um, you know, articulated under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act for now almost 50 years. But it's only in recent years that the industry has really begun to advance these. And I will say, you know, just before this discussion, I got off of a, a discussion that was convened by um, folks within the OCC, and there is broad sort of federal agency support for these programs in which representatives from uh, TD Bank, uh, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo were all discussing their recently developed special purpose credit programs. Um, so it's something that's really broadly advancing in the marketplace and is meant to really provide special loan products for formerly historically disadvantaged communities. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, are you able to speak a little bit to the first generation down payment assistance programs? 
and just give us a, a little bit more information of what that's really about in case, you know, obviously there's probably some folks here who aren't familiar with that program and just maybe help them understand what it is and how can they, you know, take part in that, making sure um, it's happening for their um, community and their participants at their agencies. Absolutely. So um, first generation down payment assistance programs are sort of another newly um, kind of um, broadly uh, um, um, considered policy approach to addressing the persistent home ownership uh, gap uh, along racial lines. Um, the the rationale for targeting first generation home buyers is, you know, that those who were, you know, um, uh, the descendants of victims of exclusionary housing policies you know, would likely um, not have, you know, benefited from intergenerational wealth and not not be able to, you know, have the kind of down payment or other fi financial means to, you know, secure um, um, credit. And so, um, although first gener generation programs are not themselves racially targeted in the way that special purpose credit programs may be, um, statistically speaking, first generation home buyers tend to be people of color. And these programs are also often targeted to first generation consumers who are, you know, income restricted within like 100 to 120 percent of AMI and so or below. And so, um, you know, most people who are first gen home buyers at those income levels are disproportionately people of color. And so there have been, you know, um, a, a set of these programs that have been instituted across the country. Um, oftentimes they focus on, um, you know, down payment assistance, um, providing between ten and thirty thousand dollars in assistance to buyers, um, and you know, they're, you know operating in different localities across the country and there's several that include you know entire states and so um, it's another approach that's been taken in recent years to um not just uh provide uh affordable housing to first time first time home buyers but specifically first generation home buyers and those are defined in different ways and sometimes they're defined as broadly as to include you know those whose parents or guardians lost their homes during the post 2008 foreclosure crisis and individuals who at any point in their hood were in the foster care system. So there's different definitions under first generation programs as they've been developed, but it's another approach that has been taken to address these issues. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you. Um, you know, there's been so much conversation around appraisal bias. Um, I know um, that the Fair Housing Centers are still getting a lot of, you know, complaints um, about that. Um, you know, we've had at my agency personally, we've had some complaints and, and some families wanting to get more information on that. But if you could just tell us a little bit about how um, the Fair Housing Alliance is addressing some of the appraisal bias concerns and complaints. Thanks so much for the question. And uh, this is another issue that has um, emerged really in recent years, um, in part as a recognition to the extent to which it's tied to, you know, historically undervaluing communities of color um, and the appraisal industry itself and appraisal practices. Um, <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and, uh, and in particular, the federal government has instituted a entity to review federal agency interface with the appraisal industry and steps that can be taken to mitigate bias in the industry through any federal agency interface under the PAVE task force. Um, and so there's a report that they've issued with recommendations um, that they are um, proceeding with now implementing with different federal agencies. Um, and our office was actually commissioned to do a report for an entity called the Appraisal Subcommittee, which is um, meant to provide oversight of the appraisal industry. Um, and we looked at bias in the appraiser uh, 
qualifying criteria and the appraisal standards and noted in a report that was issued in January of 2022, some broad issues in the industry. It's an industry that's more than 97% white. And in order to gain access to the industry, you have to have a supervising appraiser or a mentor or uh, for a period of time. And those are foster handing off the industry keys to those within your network. And when it's such a segregated network, it has behest a really segregated industry. And so we call that a lot of those qualifying criteria into question. Um, but we also note that there are broader elements of the appraisal industry associated with the approach that appraisers take in their valuation and the sales comparison approach that's used for appraisals, which basically build upon the segregated policies that we touched upon briefly in the, in the start of the PowerPoint, yeah. but in a way that actually allows for our kind of discretion and further bias that's built into the system. And Fannie Mae um, recently, in addition to Freddie Mac, as was referenced in the presentation, issued uh, research, the uniform appraisal data set, which is a data set that the GSEs have from the millions of loans that they have purchased. Mm -hmm. And from that data, they're able to analyze the comps that were made, the times that they were made, and really evaluate deep bias within the system. We we'll call upon the GSEs to not just release the aggregate data, which they did this past October, and we applaud them for that, but to take steps to issue loan level data of the sort that we have in Humda, which could really be used to reform practices in the industry and ensure fair housing compliance. There's definitely investigative and enforcement efforts that we can take with our Fair Housing Center partners across the country. And, uh, you know, we're, we're here for as a resource in doing that, but there's broader industry reform that needs to happen. And we're working with our national civil rights partners in this space, the uh, National Consumer Law Center and the Legal Defense Fund and, and many others um, to pursue kind of some of these reforms as well. Yeah, yeah, great information. Um, I think, you know, just with, with everything you're saying, it really takes a team of people, you know, working together to help, you know, make the changes um, that are needed um, surrounding, you know, appraisal bias, you know, fair housing, you know, redlining and and, and all of those other things. Um, and I know at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about some ways that, you know, community agencies, you know, such as Gesher is the one that I work for about doing our part, you know, um, obviously staying informed on what's happening with fair housing, um, you know, making sure that we're, we're working with our staff so they know, again, what the violations are, how to recognize that. Um, and then also, you know, providing this information um, um, to the community about fair housing and what, what that looks like or what it should be for them. Can you just really touch on anything else that you think would be impactful, um, you know, to um, the audience here today that they can do themselves to help, you know, fight this issue? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think if you're, uh, you know, interested in some of these issues um, can definitely send along some resources. Um, but uh, in terms of taking action, I mean, I think if, you know, if you're working with clients or even community development uh, entities that are encountering barriers from appraisals that are below contract price or below cost of building prices, you know, I think those are instances where there may be valuation that may be challengeable and um, there may be investigative means that could be taken to build cases to challenge some of those valuations in the industry. And, you know, we're definitely interested in being a resource along with local fair housing center partners and, um, you know, um, uh, um, Latasha, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the work again of local fair housing centers in this space and how they can field complaints. But, um, you know, depending upon wherever you are in the country, you go to the National Fair Housing Alliance website, there's a find local help 
mm -hmm. tab and you can find a map where there may be offices that can provide fair housing investigation enforcement services. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, for me, you know, personally and, and with my agency, I always reach out to our local uh, fair housing, um, you know, uh, office here in, in Michigan. And again, there's a lot of great information on the website. But as I stated earlier, just stay connected, you know, with, with the fair housing, um, you know, offices in your area because they have a lot of great information. Um, again, you know, work with those individuals there to uh, help them, you know, uh, help your clients, you know, file complaints or even just more, you know, giving your staff that information that they need you know staying on top of trainings i think is going to be really key for all of us to um, help that fight because the more we're informed the better we can inform the community um and so uh, that's one thing that i do um you know really always stress not only to you know my my staff but also to other community partners and managers um that are in my area so i encourage you know all of you um, on the call as well just to, to stay connected i think that's going to be huge um and just also to i know we talked a little bit earlier um with uh, harsh and in, in the uh, black wealth data center making sure we stay connected with that as well i think it's important that we're very um informed but if you could just maybe talk about how the information that was presented and and maybe we can have harsh uh you know join back in as well how can we help practitioners and advocates kind of fight this fair housing battle it, it's it's a battle that's been ongoing for a lot of years but i think the more of us that come together um the more work that we can do together i'm happy to have, do you want to take a stab at it you want me to go whichever <laughs> And quickly take a stab on the data that is presented on the platform. Uh, so right now on the platform, you can see uh, like discrepancies broken down by race around uh, interest rates, property values. Uh, you can also like go down to a zip code level to see like what home ownership rate looks like. You can look at how your county is faring in terms of climate change related resiliency and like what does it mean uh like is home ownership really an asset or during like uh climate change if you're like county or if your local government is not prepared to address like some of the community needs around changing climate resilience and infrastructure we are also constantly like adding and bringing in new data sets like our next focus is also to, like bring data that talks about housing affordability so uh there is information there that will soon be on the platform around like housing affordability and you can always connect with us we have office hours so we are also like always willing to like talk to like uh, community organizers to like figure out like what else data is needed and like how data can help inform our decisions on the ground thank you Awesome, awesome. Thank you um, so much uh, for that. So Morgan, I just have one quick question um, for you um, before we start to wrap up here. I know that there is a housing, fair housing conference coming up in July. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what folks can expect and why should they attend? I think that's going to be an awesome uh, conference. You know, we're, um, you know, three years into the pandemic now and we're starting to get back in person and do to attend as well because i'm confident it's going to be a lot of great information and again it's important to me that i stay informed but if you could tell some of the practitioners here um, a little bit about that conference and what they can expect and why should they attend absolutely um yeah so a couple of things uh yeah so we're, we're hosting our, it's our annual conference um in dc in mid-july and uh i mean it's a it's a terrific convening of uh the network of fair housing advocates who are really pioneering some of the current efforts that we've discussed today around some of these programs in different communities. Um, so, you know, some of this will certainly be discussed. Um, you know, there's other efforts underway, including, um, you know, uh, a, 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 a Supreme Court docket that may have some landscape that we operate in. Um, as well as some issues that have been taken up by the Supreme Court for consideration in this next term that will really impact the ways in which we can do some of the work that we do. So there'll be some um, interesting discussion about um, updates in jurisprudence and some of the litigation that's pending that may impact some of that, that landscape. Um, there's, you know, uh, it's a great community, I think is the bottom line though. Um, if anyone is interested in learning more, there's more information on our 
I guess our website um, for sure. Um, but I did want to say on the data front, just to with the with the Black Wealth Data Center, just a couple of quick points about the utility of that data from a fair housing perspective. You know, I really think that you know, for, from from the standpoint of of developing a special purpose credit program, um, the regulation in, you know in, indicates that in particular for profit entities must prepare a written plan that contains information supporting the need for the program. I think there's a lot of data on that site that could be used for that end. Um, also, HUD just accepted comments, again, for um, a new regulation around the affirmative furthering fair housing mandate as it pertains to HUD program participants, those that in particular receive, you know, community development block grant funds and other kinds of housing funding that they have to use use those funds to promote fair housing and go through this planning process. And I think the data in the Black Wealth Data Center could be really helpful for some of that analysis and for underlying the assertions for different policy recommendations that could come out of those processes associated with some of that, some of that data. And you know, I think also there's um, broader interest in thinking about fair housing claims associated with what's referred to as perpetuation of segregation. And that is a policy that is regarded as discriminatory because when put into practice, it perpetuates segregation within a community. And there's different ways that those claims may be developed, you know, moving forward. Um, and, um, and there's a, you know, a law review article that was written in the last few years, sort of details, you know, how these claims might be thought about more. But I think as we have the sort of data that we can access through the Blackwell Data Center, we may be able to fashion those kinds of complaints more, more creatively and with the data at hand to do that. Awesome, awesome. I agree. Um, Morgan, I thank you so much for, um, you know, taking time out of your day uh, to speak with us. Um, Harsh as well, thank you so much for your information on um, all of these disparities that, you know, continuously um, just really overshadow our communities a little bit. But thank you both um, for working um, to, to try to eliminate some of these, again, disparities that are, are really just taking over. And um, so we certainly appreciate both of you uh, joining today. Um, and thank you for having me as well. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dara um, so that we can close out. But if, again, if we are here, we're still available. If you have questions or comments um, about any of the information, either for myself, Morgan, or Harsha, we'd be more than happy uh, to uh, address those questions. Um, but thank you both again so much. A lot of great information. Um, the PowerPoint will be available um, because I, I'm sure it was a lot <laughs> to take in. And so you probably wanna go back um, and look over some things. I, I know I definitely want to as well, um, again, because it was such a valuable information and I think is important for all of us to know um, exactly what is happening um, in these communities and really that helps us to be able to work to try to eliminate some of the issues. Yeah, thank you, Lolcha. Thank you for carrying this conversation into Harsha and Morgan. Um, one question I do want to voice over that came in um, as you all were speaking, and Morgan, I think you and Lolcha actually touched on this, that people can connect with their local fair housing uh, centers. But um, someone wrote in, as a small nonprofit, how can I help my community? So are there other things they can do, programs they can push for, uh, local policies they can push for, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think as a small nonprofit, you may be interfacing in the housing market in ways that you see housing discrimination issues. And if you can reach out to your local fair housing center, they could be a resource in helping you navigate and potentially challenge those, those barriers. Um, and, uh, you know, I would also say, um, you know, there, you know, there, there, um, there, there may be more activity that jurisdictions undertake um, under the kind of forthcoming affirmatively furthering fair housing provisions. And as local partners uh, with those jurisdictions, you may already have sort of avenues to reach those kind of um, city partners, but you should engage in those processes and have a voice to ensure that those processes really look at the real scope and depth of issues of segregation and wealth inequity across your communities so that the city plans and kind of priorities that come out of that and the programs and funds as they're directed then address those issues. So I guess those would be two things to, to touch on. 
And I just want to add, um, you know, um, overseeing again uh, the financial um, education housing um, department um, at my agencies. Volunteer, you know, um, just volunteer. You know, there's again opportunities. You can go through your local uh, fair housing office. There's um, again, there's a tab there. You can click on it for volunteer opportunities. But also, I think it's just good to start to build those relationships with with some of the folks over um, at your your fair housing centers. They're going to really be the ones that kind of help you bring um, help bring you into that fold. Great. Thank you both so much. I'm going to um, push us through to the end here. We really appreciate your thoughtfulness, um, the slides, the walk through the data, Harsha and Lalcha to you for really leading the conversation um, as a member of our Affordable Housing Network Steering Committee. So My pleasure. You. My pleasure. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, we missed that. Okay. So next steps. Once this survey or once this webinar ends, a survey will pop up on your screen. Um, you can take that and tell us how we did. We love feedback here at Prosperity Now. So any way we can know better, you know, what sort of webinars you're looking for, the topics you want to see us cover, um, please let us know. You can also visit our Advocacy Center on the Prosperity Now website to stay up to date with advocacy efforts. Um, right now, we've had uh, previously have had some um, advocacy campaigns pushing for federal housing and home ownership legislation. But right now we're really focused on uh, advocating for federal baby bonds policy. So you can find that on our advocacy center. Uh, keep an eye on your email inbox for this webinar's presentation and recording. We know we presented a lot of information, so you'll have that at your fingertips soon. And then check out the Prosperity Now event page for more webinars and events, both in person and virtual that are coming up. Finally, um, most of you are already a member of our affordable housing network, but we want to encourage you to plug into our community um, by joining any of our networks. You'll be invited and see these invitations for webinars, working groups. You can volunteer to facilitate peer discussions, serve in leadership roles, and more. And with that, thank you for joining us today. Uh, really appreciate the time you spent with us and please, please complete our survey. Thank you.